everybody got quiet, so I might as well get started. I've got one more minute, so it's mine. Good morning, God. It's good to have everyone here this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, we want to thank you for spending this time with us. Uh, <clears throat> if, you're viewing, if you're viewing on live stream, uh, we appreciate you spending this time with us also. Uh, and notice, uh, take note today, this afternoon at 5.30, we'll have a, another live stream, but we'll actually be here. So kind of keep that in mind. <clears throat> if you have a no noise-making device of any kind, if you will, turn those off or silence them and uh, so we won't disrupt the service in the next few minutes. Uh, this is the first Sunday to begin our somewhat normal worship service. Uh, note I did say services, and that's plural. So this afternoon at 5.30, we'll begin to have our regular Sunday evening worship service. Uh, the building will be sanitized after everyone has left the building after this morning's worship service. And I'll have some additional announcements later on in the service. Also remember, too, there's uh, plenty of these uh, handouts. Make sure that you get these. It has uh, the activities that's going to be taking place this week and also the sick list. And so uh, we ask that you do that and, and take, uh, uh, take, uh, uh, take care of the, your prayers and mention those folks in your prayers. And so we'll be talking about that just a little bit later. So let's bow for a word of prayer and we'll begin. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we come this day, the first day of the week, asking you to be with us as we worship together in prayer. Father, we ask that you be with us as we lift our voices up in song and help us to think about the words that we sing so we can be blessed with the message and be reminded of your love for us as we blend our voices together in sweet harmony. Our Father, help us blot out the cares of the world in the next few minutes so we can totally focus on Gary's message that he's prepared to deliver us and help him to remember those things which he's prepared so our lives can truly be enriched from your word. Father, let us not forget that we've been given the Lord's Supper as a reminder of what our freedom from sin cost our Savior Jesus Christ. Father, when we live our lives for our Savior, we can show the world that we'll never forget the sacrifice that he made for us. Father, as we bring our offering, let us do so with a cheerful heart. Father, let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 186. 186. One eighty six. One eighty six. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty.
475. My hope is that on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring, but holy on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock and sand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Works, and I will show you my faith by my works. 
You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was filled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he, he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works, and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful for this avenue of prayer that we come to you, petition, things that are on our hearts and things that are going on in our lives. And Father, we have several that are physically sick and having health issues, and we ask you to be with them. We ask you to be with Bob Allen. Shirley, Shirley and Blair, Rhonda Fleming, Alice King, Buddy Oxley, Sandy Smith, Patsy Ainsworth, Ron Muir, Faye Britt, Kathy Gutlich, Vivian A. Bear, Sandy Lewis, Steve, Steve Higginbotham, and Terry Jeremy Cowles. All of you ask you to be with them and you know their needs and you know that he knows what's best for them, and you can help them in the ways that you can. Father, we ask you to be with the leadership of this congregation, the elders, to, as they go through decisions that they have to make, and the leadership that they have, that they can shepherd the flock here, and that we will all be in eternity with you someday. Father, we ask you to be with those that have lost loved ones, that and comfort them in the way that you can. Just be with them. Father, we're just thankful for all that you do for us. And thank you for your word that we can go to and to learn about you and to learn how to live our lives and how to deal with situations. And Father, help us to always turn to you for that and to search your scriptures to know what you want us to do. We ask you to just be with us all. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, this time, mark your songbooks number 696. Number 696 will be the song after the lesson this morning. And then the next song we will sing will be number 25. Number 25. Please stand. 25.
Good morning. What a joy to be together with all of you. We are blessed by some visitors. We're thankful that they're here. We're also thankful that some of our uh, folks that have had to remain in because of health concerns and so forth are now feeling more comfortable coming back. And I appreciate all of you that probably are like me. You don't really like the mask, but in, in the common areas you wear it, but for the sake of other people. And that, that's what brotherhood's all about, is uh, showing your concern and your care uh, through actions like that. that may not always be the most pleasant you know, uh, for the rest of us, but we're, we're thankful for you and all of you. What a great, great family this is. Our classes have resumed or on uh, Wednesday night. We're actually going to go to two classes this Wednesday night. I think Richard's chomping at the bit, ready to go back at it. I think you're in Luke. That's what I heard you tell somebody. So just read the whole book. It's all right, but uh, you'll be ready. I think he's on over toward 10, 11, 12, somewhere along in there. But uh, you'll, you'll enjoy that study if you want to go there and here in the auditorium. We're going to study the book of Galatians, and that's a rich book. Freedom in Christ is the focus of that uh, book, and we, we hope that you'll be uh, ready to be uh, studying that beginning uh, this Wednesday night. In 1507, Martin Luther was ordained as a priest in the Catholic Church. He was of the Augustinian order, a very well-studied uh, man. Uh, in fact, his dad really wanted to be a lawyer. I'd say there's a fair amount of difference between a preacher and a lawyer, but, uh, but uh, that's, that's where it went in his life. Uh, he eventually went to work in a place called Wittenberg, Germany. And Luther was, uh, was a very tender-hearted man. Now, sometimes if you read his writings, you won't know that because he also could be very stern. <laughs> but he was very, very tender-hearted. He loved the people with whom he worked. And it hurt him deeply to see how that the church of which he was a part, the Catholic Church, was so demanding and so insistent on works, 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 if you want to go to heaven. It so impacted him that eventually he, he came to literally write in the margin in the book of Romans when it said, a man is saved by faith, he put in the margin alone by itself. Now, if you know that about him, it doesn't really surprise you that he would then come along and he would say about the book of James, the little epistle of James, that it is a straw epistle, that there's nothing to it. James didn't understand, he said, works and faith. He didn't appreciate it at all. Unfortunately, Luther's view has become the view of many. Uh, the reality is, if you were to go out and talk to the average person who believes in Christ, uh, that you might very well be exposed to the idea of, uh, well, I'm, I'm okay. I've got faith. I believe in Christ. And that's going to take me home to heaven. That literally is how they feel about it. It's for that reason, and also because we're going through the book of James, and it's what we come to next, that for just a little bit this morning, we want to talk about how that brothers show faith by works. And as we do this, I hope that we'll actually see that James and Paul are in complete agreement. And I think we're going to be able to demonstrate that from a couple of passages. But first of all, as we look at the book of James, let's first note that he talks about useless faith. Faith that has no value at all. It's worthless, we might say. A useless faith. Listen to him in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? You know what we usually talk about when we're talking about this? 
He, he talks a good ball game. <laughs> uh, he, he can talk about it all day long, but he can't play it. Not any good at all. Can't win. Never going to make it. For years and years and years, you know, Cubs fans across this nation of ours were by June saying, wait till next year. Now, for those that don't know anything about baseball, they start playing the 1st of April. And usually the World Series is in October. So if you knew by June that you're out of it, your team ain't much. Let's just put it simply. And they weren't. For years, they weren't. But boy, every year, wait till next year. Wait till next year. We're going to get you. Well, they didn't win ball games. They didn't get them in the World Series for a hundred years. It didn't get them into the World Series. That's how bad it was. The truth is that there are people right now who say, I believe in God. And yet if you look at their life, you'd have to say, really? How's it made a difference in your life? How, how am I going to recognize it? That belief that you have in God has had zero impact on who you are and what you're about. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote about these matters. I first want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, because that's one of the ones that Luther might well have looked at and said, see there, you know, Paul and James are different. Here's what he says. Who has saved us, he's talking about Jesus, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. The works that he's talking about there, if you look closely, it says our works. And that little word, O-U-R, our, is very, very important. The idea here is meritorious works. If you hired me to do a job and you said, we're going to pay you $10 an hour. If I worked one hour, could I come to you and if that's all you wanted me to do, and I, could I come to you and say, you owe me $10? Well, sure. Because that was the agreement, right? Here's a job. You do it. You will merit. I will owe you $10. Paul is letting us know here, as he writes to Timothy, that when we get to the judgment day, none of us is going to be able to say to God, I worked so hard for you. I've got this list of things that I did. I've got a, a board that I tallied my works on. See there, you owe me heaven. No, not at all. But did Paul believe that works were important? The answer to that is quite different. In the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. A couple of things to pick up on here. First of all, this preacher was to constantly affirm. It is a regular part of the preaching of the gospel. What is it? That you ought to be careful. What do you do if you're careful? Well, let me put it to you this way. If I'm going to reach in the oven... I try to care, be careful to always either have a, a glove, an oven mitt, or have a, a hot, what I call a hot pad between me and whatever's coming out of that oven. Make sense? I think it does. I'm going to be very careful to do that. And every now and then I mess up and I end up burnt because I wasn't careful. And so here's Titus. Titus, Paul says, you be careful to tell people what? To maintain. You see the word, maintain good works. 
So Paul believes that works are important, but not meritorious work. He's not said that anywhere. If you look, for example, in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, those who like to support this concept of being saved by faith or by grace alone will underscore verses 8 and 9. But notice verse 10 says we are his workmanship. What does he want us to do is his workmanship? Do good work. See, that's our role, to do good works. Why? Because they'll save us? No. Because that demonstrates I believe in God. I trust him. That's the idea that is set forth by, really, by both James and Paul, but not just by them. If you turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, you'll see what some people describe as the great white throne judgment makes sense because the great white throne is pictured here in this particular set of verses. Listen to what he says in the latter part of verse 12 of Revelation 20. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now, if you're saved by faith alone, why would God judge you by your works. Because, as we're going to see shortly, works are the only way to demonstrate that I have faith. That shows that my faith is alive and not dead. So James begins with this idea of a useless faith. And that useless faith is, is a faith that is all talk, no walk. He goes straight from that to talking about an undemonstrated faith. The use of faith is the undemonstrated faith. Listen to him, beginning in verse 15. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by, by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, just imagine this morning that some brother in Christ, maybe from a distant place, who knows, has come into this assembly. Their clothing is tattered and worn, barely, you know, really thick enough to even, even cover the body. Just that bad. And they're emaciated. And you look at them and you think, man, when did this guy have his last meal? He is in bad shape. And you go up and greet him and you come to find out he is a brother. And you say to him, brother, do you, you, you look like you're going to have a tough time going out in, and we can't say this today, can we, in this cold weather. But <laughs> you look like you're going to have a hard time here, you know. Uh, and, and when did you have your last meal? And he says, well, last week sometime. I say, well, you know what, brother? I, I am so glad you were here today. I hope you go away warm and full of food. Now, let me ask you a question. If it's cold outside, is it going to be warm after what you just said? No. Is he going to be temporarily satisfied, food-wise? No. That's why some time ago, not just for brethren, but for others, that we started, through the agency of one of our good deacons, you know, Terrence, we started the blessing bags. I've got at least two of them in, my, in the van, you know, where Teresa and I most often will bump into people that, what, they're out there with a... Sign, homeless, need food. Well, it's got water in it. It's got some various things to eat in it. I grant you it won't fill them forever, but it'll help them for right then, won't it? That's a demonstrated faith. But an undemonstrated faith, no good at all. It doesn't work for the individual that it says it cares about. And that's what James points out. Notice verse 18 as he continues. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by 
my works. So, I have faith. How do you know? This individual that said that never attends a worship service. Never opens a Bible. Never does a good deed in the name of Christ. Would you pick them as being a faithful person? That's pretty easy to answer, isn't it? No, I, I wouldn't pick them. In contrast to that, we have this fellow that says, I have faith. And what do you see? He's never absent. If, if he's able at all, he's present when the doors are open. He's out there doing good things for other people. He's teaching other people the Bible. He's constantly in the Word of God. Which one of those people do you think has faith? Pretty easy, isn't it? It's the fellow that shows it by his works. And that's exactly what... James talks about, and I notice verse 19 as he continues. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Now, if you go down the path of faith alone, what are you saying? I believe in God. That's what faith amounts. I believe in God. I believe in one God. Okay. James says, that's great. You know who else believes in one God? The devils. Look at a couple of instances, just two out of the life of Christ. The first one's in Mark. In the book of Mark, as we look at it in chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, we find uh, this, this particular record. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Now, what were those demons doing? If you've read the life of Christ, you know what they're doing. They're tormenting people. They're causing them all kinds of grief. They have no concern for anybody else but themselves. And yet, did they recognize Jesus as the Son of God? No doubt about it. They knew exactly who he was. Turn over to Luke chapter 8. This may be the stronger of these two and a little bit easier to see. We want to pick up at, at verse... Well, we'll just go ahead and pick up verse 26 and get the whole context. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. And he broke the bonds and was driven by the demons into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. I want you to see something here. I want all of us to see it. These demons don't just believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They recognize his authority, don't they? Don't send us to the abyss. That is, don't send us where you've got the devil and his angels reserved for eternal condemnation. Don't send us there. So they recognize who he is, and they recognize his power, but what good does it do them? None. So James is saying, faith without works is undemonstrated. And what good Will it do you? And the answer is none. So finally, James comes to genuine faith. And look at the way he describes genuine faith, and then he illustrates it just in case people like me 
didn't get it the first time. Here's what he has to say. Let's start at verse 20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Now, I couldn't quite say what James says here. He calls this fellow empty-headed. Foolish, empty-headed. You, 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 you can't reason at all, fella. No, it, it is evident that faith without works is dead. Now, he begins to show why he says that. Two examples are given by James of genuine faith as seen in works. The first is Abraham. Begin to verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Now, I'm not James and I'm not inspired. But for me, it's a little easier to look at this passage if you flip it upside down. Look the, look the last first. The quotation that he gives there is from Genesis chapter 15. And in Genesis chapter 15, God made some promises to Abraham. And then Moses, by inspiration, says he had faith and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But that means it was put on his credit. Now, you say, what does that mean? Well, let's try this out. Let's say that you're like me. And then on occasion, your bank account gets down to the point where you're a little bit afraid to use a check or a check card. You got $10 in the bank, you think. And the item you're buying is $9.98, tax and all. And then lo and behold, you, think, you know, I got to check this out. I got to be sure that I got enough. And so you open up your app which nobody ever had until a few years ago, but you open up your app and you see $1,010. Where did that come from? You call a bank. They said, well, some nice guy came by here and he, he got that credited to your account. Now, see, I didn't do anything to get it there. Not a thing in the world. By the way, that has not happened to me. And if you would like to help out... No, well... <laughs> You get the idea, right? Here was Abraham. Was he righteous? The easy answer to that is no. He's just like the rest of us. He struggled with sin. You can't be righteous and sin also won't work. But because Abraham believed God, it was credited to his account. It was put in his account even though he didn't Deserve it personally. Now, I would start there. Why? Because now he shows us how he lived up to that statement. How did he do it? Isaac was the son of promise. God told him, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. What all did God promise in regard to the seed of Abraham? He said, You're going to have so many. Descendants are going to be like the stars of heaven in numbers. They're going to be like the sands of the sea. And Isaac's the one that's going to be the one through whom all this happens. And then one day, Genesis chapter 22, God comes to Abraham and he says, you take Isaac, your son, your only son, because he's truly the only one of a kind. He's the only son of a promise. And he says, you go offer him on Mount Moriah. Now, how did Abraham prove that he had faith? How did he show a genuine faith? He got the beast of burden. He got the wood. He got the fire. He got the knife. And the servant led apparently the beast of burden. And 
Abraham got Isaac to go with them, and off they went toward Mount Moriah. And when they arrived at a point where they could see it in the distance, Abraham turned to his servant and he said, you stay here while the boy and I go yonder and worship. Now watch this. And we will return to you. The writer of Hebrews says he offered him up. Now, he didn't do it actually. But it appears to me he, in his mind he'd already made that commitment. And God says through James that when he did that, he showed that for good reason, his faith was accounted for righteousness. That's Abraham. Example number one. Genuine faith shown in his works. Example number two, and who would have ever picked this one except God? It's Rahab. Listen to him as he continues, verse 25. Likewise, not, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Now, if you've read the whole story of Rahab from the early chapters of the book of Joshua, you know that she and the other inhabitants of the city of Jericho have heard about what God did in the land of Egypt. They've heard about the crossing of the Red Sea. They know how God has taken care of these people. She has come to believe in the God of heaven. And what does that motivate her to do? Now remember, she's a wicked woman. She is a harlot. What has it caused her to do? What does it cause her to do? Take the spies in. Hide them. And when the time comes, send them out by another way. Did she demonstrate a true faith in God by what she did? Absolutely. Was she rewarded for it? Let's think about that. We've seen the two demonstrated faiths, Abraham and Rahab. Genuine faith as demonstrated in the lives they live. Now let's go back and observe two conclusions that James draws. First comes after Abraham's, verse 24. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now let's talk about Abraham a minute. What if when God came to him and said, go offer your son, and, and then God said, do you believe me? And Abraham said, yes, sir. I believe you. And he stayed right there in his tent. Do you believe him? Do, nod your head this way. <laughs> no. 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 He didn't. But that wasn't the approach of Abraham, was it? Instead, Abraham demonstrated his faith by his works. And that's why he was counted righteous. Second conclusion. Look at verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Where did Rahab live? We said Jericho. Everybody knows that, right? Where did she live in Jericho? Didn't she live in the wall? Now, even the little children, don't they sing a song? Something like that. And the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Don't they sing that? I didn't get the tune right or whatever. Aren't the words in there? Isn't that right? Don't they sing that? She lived in the wall. Did her trust in God pay off? Absolutely. Was it counted as genuine faith? Yes. How did he know she had it? She received the spies and sent them out by another way. James shows us exactly what faith's all about. The only way to really, really have faith is to show it in the works that you do. To demonstrate it in the life that you and I live. We don't want to be 
the possessors of a useless faith. We don't want an undemonstrated faith because that's not really faith at all. Instead, we want genuine faith. So here we are today. Maybe, maybe you, I, maybe we are children of God, but we've not been living like we should. How are we going to demonstrate that we're once again part of the faithful? We're going to ask for the prayers of the church, James 5, 16, so that we can be forgiven of whatever it is that we've been doing that was wrong. But maybe you're here today, and yes, you know a little bit about God. You really believe in God, but you've never taken all this into account. Now you realize you've got to do a work, but what work do you have to do? Well, the answer that Ananias gave to Saul was, Acts chapter 22, verse 16, and now I'm going to put it in our words, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved from your past sins. Do you have a living faith? A demonstrable faith? If you don't, you can change it anytime. Why not now? Why don't you come while we sing? There's a fountain treated for you and me.
us right quick to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to look at verse 16 and 17. It says, Is it not the cup of blessing which we, which we bless, a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is it not the bread which we break, a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. We have such great blessing that through God's wisdom, He knew the importance of the church. And when we obey the gospel, we are added to God's family, the spiritual family. We're able to come together, to fellowship together, and to take this memorial together, to sit at the Lord's table, and to do it as His family. We're so blessed to be able to do that. We have fellowship with not only with ourselves, but we have fellowship with God, with Christ. And we're so blessed that He has made that sacrifice for us. If you will, bow with me and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we are so humble at this time. Thank you so much for the great sacrifice that you made for us, Father. For this memorial that we can come together as your family, that we can meditate on, on what your son has, what you and your son has done for us, Father, for his death of coming here and laying his life down, uh, willingly to do so, Father, to be a perfect sacrifice that would only way to make it possible. We're grateful for that. Each one of us as the family are sitting here, Father, and taking of this bread which represents your son's body. Help us, Father, and help us to keep our minds focused on, on, on this sacrifice, to take of this memorial in a place in a way that's pleasing to you, Father, to realize again the relationship we have with you and with each other and only through your son's Sacrifice is that possible. Pray that you continue to watch over us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You bow with me and we'll pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, we again humble ourselves before you, thanking you so much for this day that you've set aside, Father, for the opportunity that we have to, Father, to, to be able to come and take this memorial. We, we're grateful for each one that's here this morning, Father, and we pray that you, again, that we'll each be mindful of the things that you've done for us in that sacrifice. Not only today, Father, but each day of our lives. We take of this cup which represents the blood that we shed, Father. We know it was a pure and innocent blood and that there was not only the physical aspects of it, but just the separation from you from the Father at, at, during that time and we we just can't fathom the great death and love that your son has shown to us. We pray that we take of this cup, Father, again as it represents his blood. We take up in the way that's glorifying the cross of the world.
Looking around the auditorium right now, I'm seeing some empty pews. Next week, when we come in here next week, uh, we expect to have more. We're continuing to grow in our numbers on our Sunday morning worship service. And so, if you will, when you come into the, uh, to the auditorium after you've gone to your classes, kind of look around and kind of be aware of and considerate of those who are coming in late. And if you want to move to it toward the middle of the pews to uh, let people come in and be, uh, be uh, to still practice social distancing, how should still remain, uh, remember to do that uh, next week. Uh, after a request from Maria's Children's Home uh, for a special fifth Sunday contribution, which that was last Sunday, uh, we have sent the them a check for $2,500. Now this includes the amount in consideration over our budget last week and also some special contributions uh, that we were able to do that. Uh, Jill Posey, mother of Mike Posey, uh, is doing well. Uh, she is in Ridge Manor and uh, they request, that family request uh, prayers for her. And also if you, if you miss Carolyn Porter, she's usually sitting right over there. She's not here this morning. She's got a sinus infection and uh, she didn't have that sinus infection. She'd be here. <clears throat> also have a, a thank you card from Loretta Ellis. And she writes, thank you all for the prayers and get well cards. It meant so much to me. The elders are trying our best to reach out to those who have not been back into our services uh, since COVID-19 began. And so we're contacting these individuals, uh, individuals, and so we would like your help also too. So uh, we, uh, we would like to emphasize one point though. If you talk to these folks and, uh, and, uh, and tell them that you miss them or whatever, uh, remember these are the people some of the people that are high risk areas, we don't, we're not asking them to come back. And also, we just kind of want them to know that we're, we're thinking about them. And, and you'll be blessed when you talk to these folks because they've not been here. And I'm sure that'll, that'll be a blessing to you also too. And it'll make, make their day and make your day too. Uh, now, those of you that, uh, that, that don't go on ground or have that kind of information and everything, there's some directions at the back, or the, uh, in the foyer back there. If you'd like to pick up one of those, uh, you, uh, you may do so as you, as you uh, exit the building here this morning. Uh, Teresa uh, would like to meet with the ladies that usually come to the uh, ladies' Bible class. Uh, they're going to... Uh, they're going to be meeting here pretty soon, so she'd like to meet with them. We'll say over here where Gary's sitting, sitting and she'll meet with them uh, it's, uh, after our services are over here in just a few minutes. Uh, Derek's going to come up here just at the well right now, and uh, he's going to tell you uh, how to, do, uh, to uh, that he's going to be sending an email of the directory to everybody. And so when that email is sent out and everything, you can... Uh, um, maybe uh, put that in a folder, one of your folders. I'm not trying to tell because I don't know. I don't know how to do it half the time anyway. So I don't know why I'm even trying to tell you. I'm letting him tell you that. He'll lead us in a in a closing song, and then we'll have the uh, prayer for the contribution and the closing prayer after that. Like Mr. Ron said, uh, there are copies of the, the directory. Uh, and on the back tables. Uh, there's a few out there. Uh, if we run out of copies today, we'll put some more on by Wednesday night and we'll keep replenishing those uh, as long as we're seeing the need for that. Um, but on, if you are on around, uh, I just want to tell you real quick, uh, on your app, you can go to the more section and click on more and then you can go to groups and then you can go over to where it says, uh, go down where it says Silver of Church of Christ, that is the entire congregation. Uh, on there will be a way where you can click on uh, participants and the people that are in that group. Um, now, the only people listed in that group are those that have set up a profile and have clicked on a, a button that says opt in to the mobile directory. So if you're on Realm, 
Check your profile out and see if you've opted in to the mobile directory. If you have not opted in, you're not going to be listed there. Uh, only the admins will have access to that. But we will be sending out a PDF copy uh, via email uh, to the whole congregation where you can have the directory uh, on your phone or computer. So please, like Mr. Ron said, create a place on your computer or on your phone, save it to your files so you'll have a copy of that. Um, if you are on Realm, there is a place uh, under files, uh, under the Silo News and Activities group that has all the past bulletins, all the past uh, directories we've sent out for the past year. So all those files are on there, you can access that. So uh, just take advantage of all these opportunities to uh, call members of the congregation so we can better encourage one another. We're gonna sing the uh, first verse of B1 in our folders, B1, uh, before our prayer for dismissal and the contribution. B1. I come back. Thankful for what you do for us and give us. 
each and every day. Help us and protect us and strengthen us and help us to encourage one another, Father, and to keep Satan from getting in our lives and, and causing us problems. Thank you. Thanks again for your love and Christ's own prayer. Amen.